Welcome back to Access to Perspectives Conversations. We are here today with Nicholas Ota from Kisumu, Kenya, talking about helicopter research and how it jeopardizes projects of sustainability. You, we will also convene around best practices to do research in a collaborative approach the right way, the better way to avoid helicopter research practices. Um, and Nicholas Auta will share with us what he has observed, what um, that entails, um, which is a recurring and very predominant, still today, a predominant issue in North-South collaborations. But let me, so yeah, welcome Auta. Thank you so much, Joe, for inviting me and for having me for this conversation. I think um, it's one of those conversations uh, that are also very pertinent to me. And uh, as a young researcher, I've had experience um, in, in several projects, and uh, it would be a good thing to share my insights and also maybe my suggestions on how this can be done. Yeah, very, very keen on hearing that. Um, let me briefly introduce you. So you did a, or you're a PhD student in, at Maseno University in Kenya currently researching on the potential of freshwater integrated multi-traffic aquaculture, also known as FIMTA FIMTA, in Lake Victoria, to help reduce the negative environmental impacts of cage aquacu aquaculture in the lake. You are a trainer in scientific writing and publishing at TCC Africa, and also since recently the founder of Writing Hub Africa, which um, trains and mentors students and early career researchers on scientific communication and data analysis, um, which we also do as access to perspectives. So we're also happy to have you in our team and are looking forward to more. We've done workshops together. We co-facilitated in some of our trainings and we're keen on also future collaborations. Um, you are championing and campaigning for open science and also a moderator of our initiative and organization now, Africa Archive, as a reviewer and quality control manager. And you also are a reviewer for various journals in the fisheries and agriculture and aquatic sciences um, ecosystems, really, or scholarly disciplines. So yeah, um, let's get the conversation started. How would you um, think, or maybe if you introduce us to some of your daily practices within fisheries, could you map out for us how a typical day in your, like in your researcher realities looks like? Are you working more in the lab or more in the field? What does it look like? Or a little bit of both, I assume. What is your research reality? most of the times ah uh, okay thank you um i think we it's a blend of both and um because i am also uh, i'm also a, a, a part-time lecturer in maseno so i train undergraduate students and also sometimes master students and um so my research work basically is um sometimes i go to the field and just set up experiments in the field and um, also sample fish and uh, sample water and um, sediments from the lake. And so I, I sometimes whatever I can process in the field, um, like, you know, taking morphometric uh, characters of the fish, like length, weight, and, you know, just uh, looking for sex and stuff like this. Those ones I can do in the field. But uh, part of analysis also I do in the lab, like gut content analysis, and I also do analysis of water quality because we know um, that water quality affects uh, fish because that's where they live. So, and also my research focuses on what do this fish, cage aquaculture, what, what influence would it have on the water quality? So, so basically I, I, I work within the lab and also in the field, but you know, I enjoy more being in the field because I get the chance to interact with the fishermen. I get the chance to interact with the, with, with the, the, the people doing aquaculture in the lake. And, you know, so that I can also share uh, part of what I got. So if, if it's just even about the, the feeding rates, how, how best can they feed the fish to enhance growth, but also not do too much that will interfere with our lake ecosystem. So those are the kind of information I also share with them so that at least they get a bit of what I'm researching on rather than just seeing me there every day and they don't have an idea. They see me picking fish samples. They see me picking water samples or sediment samples, but they don't know what I go and do with them. So when I come back, I tell them, hey, I think you are feeding too much because a lot is accumulating in the sediment. So what can you do to reduce this? So basically, that is typically that is what I do. 
So basically helping the farmers as well as doing your own research, but also helping the farmers to increase their yield and the harvest from the fish. I don't know if you can use the same word. Um, uh, talking about animals here instead of crop. Um, and also respecting the animals kind of as individuals and also as organisms in, uh, yeah, you know, the fish that they are. You know, like we're, we're both also concerned about the well being of the fish as much as the people who work with them and live of like used fisher fisheries as the source for their livelihoods. Um, so, in my view, and I think this is also what we share, everybody needs to be okay. The fish need to be okay. The fishermen need to be okay. The lake needs to be okay, like in a balanced ecosystem. So it's functional. And what we do, and it's probably also where some of your research focuses on, that if we do practice aquaculture into the extremes, like com compressing too many fish into a small area of you know, a cage or whatever, um, then we have a problem with the ecosystem and we need to yeah, either filter more, which demands for more uh, cleaning and rinsing rather than, and it's probably, is, is it right when I say that you're trying to find an approach where you can work with the fishers, fishermen and um, to develop small scale fish farming in a way that's balanced also with the ecosystem where you can have a big enough yield while making sure that the system and the ecosystem is the functional and won't get um, compromised in the process. Yes, basically, basically that's that that's right. We, you know, there's increasingly there's pressure to produce more fish. There's pressure to put, to, to, to feed uh, the human population. And uh, um, one of the things I uh, was reading through is, uh, you know, I've just realized that uh, right now this is the, the the nutrition year in Africa. So the African Union has selected this as the nutrition year. So part of it is increasing uh, production of food items. And one of them, and one of the most nutritious ones is, is fish. So we need to produce fish and we cannot stop people from um, uh, producing uh, fish in the cages. Uh, but, you know, how can we do it in a way that does not interfere with that? Because the lake, Lake Victoria is already choking in pollution. So the lake is polluted as it is. But, you know, if we also f uh, produce fish out of it, we know that uh, the fish that are thrown into the, into the cages, not all of it is eaten. What then happened to the whatever remains? So my research is focusing on, can we have a technology where we will now find other organisms uh, like bivalves? and other aquatic plants that now take up the excess nutrients that come out of these places. So, and also, you know, at the end of the day, we want um, money in the pocket and food on the table, but not at, at the expense of the environment, because if you touch too much on the environment, then one day it will retaliate. Of course it will. Uh, you, you cannot harm it forever. So we don't want to produce as much as we want, uh, you know, while harming the environment. Part of what I also do is I, I can also try to standardize uh, the, 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 the optimal uh, stocking densities for the fish. Because if we crowd too much of them, one, the growth is compromised and also there are incidences of diseases and also in terms of handling and stuff like this. So those are also things I, I am aware of. Uh, but the most important thing about this is um, um, how is my research going to be important to the people, not just to me, because um, I think it's also most of researchers, it's, it's one thing we, I think it's also part of why we are having this discussion today. Um, how do we deal with the people we collect data from? Apart from just the fact that, because uh, it's it's my research, yes, but I'm I'm working with the people. Um, I'm also trying to improve their lives. So, what if I do this research, get very good information, but they don't even know, they don't get to know this information, or um, I package it in a way that they are not able to access it. So, will they know the perspectives of my research? So, it's about access to perspective. So, do I allow them access to my my perspective of the research? Because I would, and I, that also get me the chance of getting their perspective about what I'm doing. Uh, because um, knowledge, no one is, is, is uh, you, you don't have monopoly of knowledge. You might think you're a researcher, you're coming from the university and you're living with fishermen, but there's a lot they know that might end up improving so much on your research. Yeah, it's like, and that's like also one aspect of open science, what's normally known as citizen science, but here we're talking, um, stakeholder science, really. You work on one project with stakeholders of the project, which in your case 
some of which are fishermen and women, I suppose. Um, so for you as a researcher to share with them the information that you gather and the observations you make in, like you said earlier, like you're probably overfeeding. So we need to make sure that there's not as much excess sediment in the, in the pond or in the cage. So for the ecosystem, that's water and the lakes not to choke so everybody loses on the other hand it's important for the fishermen to share with you their realities and their challenges but also opportunities and maybe also in many aspects traditional knowledge that they've collected over generations in what sustainable fish farming can look like and how that can be scaled now using technology and research insights so that's really exciting to hear about and Please join us again as you're progressing with this project and also the other research initiatives um, to share with us your insights also for a wider audience. I'd now like to move us back to the um, announced topic of this conversation, um, helicopter science. Could you briefly map out what that entails? Um, it's also known as predatory or um, parasitic research. And I would frame it in such a way that it's probably oftentimes not intended as such, but it easily turns into that. And how does it look like for, in your case, a Kenyan researcher engaging in international research projects? Like as much as, you know, the researchers come from Europe, the United States, Asia, wherever, in good faith and in with good intentions, but then what are the realities that you've observed, which then turn it into a um, disproportional or only unilateral beneficial uh, engagement? And how, yeah, and then we further down the line, we'll talk about how we can change that and what would be a more um, beneficial approach and mutually beneficial approach. But could you please map out? what you've observed, what the difficulties and challenges are. Thank you for bringing this. I, I think one of the things is, and you've also brought it out clearly, many at times it's never the intention. Most of the times, I think most researchers are, maybe they might not be aware of this, but uh, they don't come with bad intention. They're not coming like, uh, let's just go and pick data and disappear, or let's go and pick data and go and analyze it elsewhere, or let's go and pick data and just benefit ourselves. But it happens because one is many a times we don't have these very candid conversations. And um, sometimes we need to have very candid conversations at the beginning so that we are sure of uh, why are you coming here? And if you come, how are you going to work? So that everything is set up. Because if nothing is set up, then I might not know. It's it's. Let me just give you an, anal an analogy. If I live with my wife and I might, if I don't know what she likes and what she does not like, or if I don't know what she expects me to do for her, I might think I'm doing my best, but maybe I'm not doing my best because I don't have an idea what she expects me to do. But if we sit down and say, hey, um, for this month, this is what I expect us to do, and this is how we are going to operate, then it's very easy for me to know what to do. So I might end up exploiting her or hurting her in a way, but I don't have an idea. So it happens in two ways. One is sometimes uh, the researchers on this side, let me give the Kenyan context, sometimes we are not open enough about uh, what we expect of, of, of the people, of our partners from, from, from the other parts of the world. So they come and then either we, we, we do things in ways that do not really facilitate um, the research in ways that are, that are required. And I, I think um, it, as much as it's not a good thing, it's happening sometimes, but of course it's reducing these days because people are becoming aware of these things. And also, you know, we are having stronger institutions in Kenya right now, for example, that will now help vet and you need to get uh, permits from here and clearance. But the other thing is uh, sometimes I think we blame um, the people who come to do research entirely on this, but sometimes we also have a wrongdoing. Um, I want to give you examples without mentioning the names of projects. I'll just give you examples of what happens. So sometimes we, we have a partner from, from Europe, as an example. I, I worked in a project and had partners from Europe. And uh, so sometimes they visit and say, hey, we can go to the field together, collect data. You know, they, you, you go to the field to do the data, uh, the, the data collection and, you know, just setting up experiments. And then sometimes they observe the way you deal with the communities because this is what happens. I, I think for me, parasitic research is not just about people coming from other continents or that are a bit more privileged to come and, 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 and prey on us and take advantage of us. The, the local researchers also take advantage of the local communities 
it happens in that way. I've, I've witnessed it. So you go to the village as a researcher, and then you, you find some, some people in the village uh, whom you think are not uh, privileged as you are, and then so you want to take advantage of them. And you are doing this sometimes in the glare of, of your partners. You know, what do they take you for? So I think sometimes let's also be sincere and also be, in as much as we want to blame other people for our, our, our problems, we contribute to this. I'm not saying it's a good thing to take advantage of anybody, but as local researchers, if I, if I am partnering with somebody from Japan, if I'm partnering with somebody from, uh, from the UK or, or, or Sweden, and then they come to me and we are going to the field and then they see that I'm taking advantage of the people I work with, um, then I'm not saying that there are chances they will take advantage of me, but that's what I'm showing them. You, we treat people the way people treat us, the way they either see us treat others or the way we allow them to treat us. So, and also the other thing is, uh, as I said, we don't make it clear that this is what we expect. Now, at the local level, leave alone whatever is up there, at the local level, you go out there and because you want to get information from, from the local community, you lie to them about what you are researching on. It happens with researchers even here. So. Parasitic research is not just about someone from another part of the world coming to Africa to take advantage of Africa or collect data, but it's also we, we also take advantage of the local communities by, let's say, I'm giving you an example. We go and say, I want to take blood samples, and I'm only going to take to, to, to test for the prevalence of malaria along this region. And then I end up taking, uh, you know, checking about uh, HIV, TB, and other diseases without really getting your consent. I've taken advantage of you, and I, I'm, whatever I want to go and do this, with this knowledge, is my information is my own thing as a researcher. So I think we also need to come down and, you know, because if we have everything set up, if we are not going to take advantage of the people that are within our communities, then somebody coming from somewhere else might find it very hard to take advantage of us because they will say, hey, these people have ways of doing things. Why are we trying to do things differently? So that's one of those things that I've seen. Uh, yeah, that's, that's one thing I've observed in the projects I've worked with. Sometimes we take advantage of our own. It's like, I just suddenly had a, um, a trigger of thought because what you explained and just mapped out um, seem, sounds similar to what happens with research on human stem cells. Because in Europe, that's restricted. It's forbidden to conduct research on stem cells, but it's not restricted in Asia. So what happened is that many researchers from Europe, including from Germany, went to China to do the research because they believe that's important um, research to be done, but we can't do it here for the regulations. So let's go somewhere where we can actually do it. So it might sound a bit far-fetched, but I think the issue is similar where um, like you said, you uh, well, you pointed out in some cases the researchers end up lying to the target audience or to the um, data collectors and how the samples are going to be used, which I've also heard about and saw in practice. It's nothing that's very glamorous. Um, of course, oftentimes it's also due to um, regulations that seem unreasonable and are mismatching with the ambitions that research is trying to solve and serve. But we need to still comply with the highest possible standards when it comes to human rights, when it comes to research integrity or human integrity, really, to be honest and transparent about the process. And I mean, there's, there's also the in-between. So research on, on human stem cells you might find unethical because it's basically a human being or some would argue a, a lump of cells or a human being because it has a potential to develop into such whereas others see these are just three or four well hardly ever three but one two five or 16 cells well, again not five but you know where i'm going um so why would you consider that a human being and we kill the cells before it develops into anything that has a brain? Um, so there's no ethical harm in it. But So that's one thing. But And these conversations are necessary in research. But when it comes to North-South collaborations, what I've often seen is in Africa, there's no such strict data um, privacy regulations so we can just use people's credentials as if, or we can take samples and then repurpose it without telling everyone. Whereas in Europe now on paper, you, you need to inform 
the patients what their the blood samples will be used for. Um, another question is, well, is this really always happening? But on paper, it should be done. So I'm feeling we're going a bit far with this conversation. So if we focus on helicopter science again, helicopter research. So the idea is that a helicopter comes, um, drops down, well, doesn't drop from the sky, but um, researchers come into the country, um, collaborate, converse with the local researchers and then collect the data um, and then go out again and then publish the research outcomes in a Western journal without acknowledging the African contributions or the contributions made by the African colleagues. And what are the means that you've seen and heard about to avoid that from happening? And also when working with the local communities, um, also, like you said, that this also happens on a local level, on a regional level, that African scholars go to the communities and, and explain to the people, oh, we need this and that from you um, to do whatever research project. And then the results are never presented to the people. So there's no benefit for them to actually contribute. And they have invested time, often also time that's precious because they didn't then use the time to harvest. They didn't time, use the time for, for work that what they would normally have to do. So they have a constraint in investing in the project and none whatsoever reward from it. Okay, that's two, two lines of thought to, to pursue. If we take one after the other. And, and I think you already mapped um, um, earlier how, how it's possible to engage with the various stakeholders of a research project when it's local fish farming then of course bring in the fish farmers into the conversation and explain to them throughout the process designing the project with them and then also making sure that they can benefit from the research results and is that something you're also working towards and you have found best practices and how this can be achieved, how they can see the benefits from the, once the project ends or gets published, what's the outcome that can be presented from the work that you're doing back to the fish farmers? Um, I think you, as you've said, it's about like two, two lines uh, of, of thought. One, I'll, I'll start, I'll, I'll bring the conversation back to the helicopter, helicopter science you're talking about. So people come, they collect data, then they go and publish this data without acknowledging the local researchers they collaborated with, or they do the, the, the acknowledgement, but sometimes not, not really bringing out the, 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 the contribution, uh, give, giving the weight of the contribution. You know, you maybe they publish and then you are told uh, the paper has been published and your name is there, but you never maybe got the chance to contribute actually like being into the publication thing. Like I was part of the publication or I was just, you know, I found my name on that paper. So I think uh, it, it happens sometimes, um, not all the time, but as I said, most researchers are not really malicious. But I think this starts with us as, as researchers, you know, being a scientist does not make you, you know, you, you also really need to, you need to make a decision. It has to also to be very deliberate. You could have very good laws, very good, but you need to be very deliberate on what you do um, and also just share this with your, with your team members and sometimes insist on best practices and ask them, hey, at the point of designing a proposal or when you're writing these things, will you, you, know, you really need to know whom are you going to work with? We are going to collaborate with somebody from here, somebody from here. What about our local stakeholders? Who are they? Then you map all the stakeholders and say, we are going to deal with fishermen, uh, women who are uh, maybe breastfeeding mothers, if you want to do a studies on how the fish could improve on their, mm. on, their on, on, on their lives and stuff like this. And then we really need to be very conscious and, and plan with them consciously. It's not like we just map, we just say, oh, no, this are, we just list them. We need to really engage them into, integrate them into our research designing and say, what role will this person play? What role will they play? What, and then inform them of what we expect out of them. We would say, hey, we are coming here, this is the project, this is what we, we intend to achieve, this is what we are doing, and this is how you will benefit from this. But at the end of the day, there needs to be a, a formal, uh, even with the local communities, because this is one thing we've lacked for a long time. We are doing a project called the Case of Kenya Climate, uh, Kenya, Case of Kenya uh, Climate Smart Aquaculture. Agriculture project. So Kenya Climate Smart Agriculture Project is called the Case Up. So I am in the, the, the aquaculture 
section and one of the things we did is we would go to the communities and ask them we would really of course uh, sometimes when you come to the communities and try to solve their problems you might end up solving your own problems without solving theirs because they know what is pressing so you could take meat but you know they want vegetables so you we, we went out and asked them whatever the pressing issues were in, in terms of aquaculture. And we found some of them wanted to be taught on how to formulate fish feeds. Some of them wanted to be, to, wanted to be supplied with fingerlings. Some, you know, so it's different. And then now we agree with them. With this project, this is the benefits you are going to get. So we are going to train you on this, 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 and this. And then at the end of the project, you ask them, we really want you to tell us if indeed you got uh, the kind of feedback we wanted. And then we go to the local uh, area assistant chief, which are uh, the local government representatives and deposit this uh, document with them because we work with groups. So we deposit this document of agreement. And it's not a complex agreement. It's just about what have been, what benefits. And in my life, it was translated into the law, which is the local language. And it's read out to them and they also read it in their language. So the, the assistant chief, the area uh, government representative has that, 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 that document. So when the project ends, you go and, uh, you know, it's just about just talk taking and seeing this is what we said we would do, did we do it? This is what we said we would do, did we do it? And once in a while, we would, I would always go out there with my team members and just tell them where we are, what we have done so far without, you know, maybe not getting them into too much science, but just telling them, yeah, we found out that your fish is growing very fast. And I think it's because of the feeds or you need to adjust the feeding rate from this one to this one, because we sampled last week and we realized now they are this number of grams instead of this one. So this, so I think it's about just making those deliberate moves because otherwise, of course, human beings um, in, in our, very, our very own nature, we are, we are very selfish. And, um, I, I, you know, the, the, the lowest level I tell people when somebody tells me they're not selfish, I ask them when you go to a stall, a grocery store, and you find the person selling, you will tell them, I wanted to choose the best tomatoes for me or the best oranges for me. What does that mean? It means that whoever is coming behind me <laughs> should get something of a lower quality compared to what I get. So every human being is selfish, but it's about, um, to what extent, especially in the terms in terms of research, to what extent can you control your selfishness and just just try to moderate it and just don't be too selfish on, on, on some things because I'm going to get the data, I'm going to publish out of it. Why can't I just give something to these people so that because I got without them, I might not have gotten, I could not have gotten the, the results I have. So um, I think it's it takes in irrespective of however many. However much we have, you know, as you, you've given it out, you've said about on paper that we could have very good laws, but these laws have to be followed by human beings. Even if there is a police officer standing there and telling you, hey, if you don't do this, you're not going to do research, human beings will always find their ways around every single thing under the sun. So I think if you want to find your way around it, find your way around it in a good way and also try to be, just be deliberate, just be a good person, be a good researcher and be deliberate and be open in your research. I think open science is not just about, because for a long time, even for me, I thought it was about open access. So you publish in open access, but we realize it's just about being open. Be open in what you say, be open in what you do, be open in what you feel, because if you feel the community is not treating you right, be open with them, tell them, you know, can we go back and renegotiate? Because I see you said you are going to give me three points to do my experiments. Now you are saying two are busy, you're only giving me one. How that, that, you know, so just be open throughout the research period, be as open as possible. That will help everybody. Yeah, I feel it's also a matter of respecting everybody's contribution and acknowledging everybody's contribution. And as scholars, one way to acknowledge, like when it comes to the scientific writing and publishing part is by embracing new taxonomies instead of having an alphabetical author list or not alphabetical, alphabetical would be one approach. So instead have a hierarchy of contributions by scholars only, what the credit taxonomy, um, and we put the link to that also in the show notes, um, that credit taxonomy suggests to list each and everybody's contribution to the project, which might include also local communities or uh, like the a brand for fishery fish farming agency or um, institution to list the individuals and also the institutions that have contributed to, to the su success of a research project. And that can be clearly described through the credit taxonomy. And then as for a start, that's then on record on paper 
And there can also be other rewards, like you described, if we allow, in your case, the fishermen to participate in the project design to learn about the actual needs and then let them also learn from the research progress by you informing them how to change the formula for the fish to grow not quick, um, but um, as slow and as fast to make sense for this for their organic system to be functional and to be like a healthy fish breed, but also to yield um, big enough of a harvest for, for you know, food production, um, then everybody wins. And to make that transparent in the process and to make it part of the project design in the first place, I think is how we can create equal acknowledgement, equal opportunities for everybody in the process and avoid what we earlier labeled as helicopter science or predator research on a local or international level. Would you yeah. agree? And can you add to that? Or I, I agree with that. And um, I'll just add to, because I know we are going to that discussion, I think we can just put it here. Um, part of the things that can now also be done is, um, I think one of the things is, um, if 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 the, the the partners from from more privileged places, because I, sometimes in research I don't even want to say that people are more privileged than others, because um, you are coming to do research in Africa or you are coming to do research in this part of the world because there's something you cannot research on. So we are privileged in that sense. It's only that sometimes we don't want to see it. Um, we are privileged to have Lake Victoria that is not there in Sweden. We have we are privileged to have Lake Victoria that is not there in. Um, in, uh, in, in uh, Mozambique, for example, we are privileged to have like, we, you know, so we also have a privilege. So it's only that sometimes it may be the technological privilege that would be there. But I think what can happen is if you focus on the, the uh, on empowering the local, uh, the locals. So like the local researchers, um, there was a time I was working in a project and we were taking to Japan and we were trained for six months under the project. The collaborators took us to Japan as research assistants and trained us for six months before the project kicked off. So that when we came back, we had the idea. So we really needed, we really had the, 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 all the information required for us to do the research. So I have that skill even right now. So that partnership helped me because I was empowered by being taken to a lab where I would get the kind of equipment that I may not able be, to be able to get from here. So those kind of things. One is empower local research. Yes. Secondly, um, sometimes most of these editors and reviewers, um, if a paper is sent to you, and this could be far-fetched, but if a paper is sent and, and then you see, because sometimes you, in the write-up you could figure out, you could see, ah, okay, maybe this research was done in Uganda, because sometimes even the title could say uh, something, something in Uganda, and then you realize, hey, am I seeing Uganda in this paper? You might not, of course, I may be, somebody will say you are being judgmental or something like this, but sometimes it takes such kind of steps. Just, you could ask the authors to just, because if you see through the affiliation and you realize there is no uh, Ugandan uh, uh, institution in the affiliation, and this research is all about Uganda, mm -hmm. fisheries of Uganda or fisheries in Kenya or aquaculture in Kenya or the malaria in, in Mozambique, and there is no institution in, in Mozambique and there is no no, any, not not anybody in the authorship that is from that country. And then, so, as a reviewer, as a, an, an, an editor, ask a question. Ask them, "Hey, mm -hmm. um, I have a concern. This research is about Uganda, and uh, I'm not seeing any Ugandan here. I'm not seeing any Ugandan institution here. Maybe can you explain? You are not going to reject the paper, but give them the chance because that shall have challenged them. They might just feel shy and go and include somebody and tell them, "Hey, we submitted a paper, and there is a question here that we need to address." So. Let's put you as part of, so even if they are doing it out of fear, next time they will deal differently because they will now, when they want to submit another paper without somebody or an institution from that country, they will ask themselves, hey, what if it backfires? Or if, what, what, what if we are asked about the same thing? So editors and reviewers can also help us in this. In, in, in this. You know, if you find a paper and you, you find it's done in a country, and there's no one from that country, there's no institution from that country, ask them, hey, uh, you know, uh, just in a polite, I'm not saying throw it out, but ask them, I'm concerned. This is about Lake Victoria and the, 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 this, the research was based in Kenya, but I'm not seeing any Kenyan institution. I'm not seeing any Kenyan here completely. So maybe would you mind explaining why that is? They can have a very valid reason. Maybe they approached us or we said we don't want that kind of publication or we don't want to associate with it, but let them give some explanation. Then that will make them, next time when they're dealing with other people, they will be like, ah, okay, so we, we, we really need to do things differently. So at the point of publication, that is one thing that we can be, that, that can really, that can really be, uh, 
uh, done. And also the other thing is some of these projects, even before they end, most of them are either uh, um, um, presented at, in seminars or, or, or conferences at international level. As a researcher sitting listening to these things, if somebody is presenting data from a different country and they're not mentioning, you, you can find the way they're mentioning them. Maybe um, I'm a PhD student doing my research in Kenya. So when I'm presenting something in a, uh, in a conference and I am from Iceland, of course, this is my data. It's, it goes into my PhD. So I might not really put everyone there because, but just look at how they talk about the people who helped them, who contributed towards the collection of this data. Are they talking about anybody or are they saying like they came and collected this data alone? This was their sole work. Ask them. I'm not saying to challenge them, or but ask them in a polite way, even in, your, in, in the Q&A question, section, ask them, hey, um, is, did any other person from that country contribute to this? And, you know, just look at them and see how they react to it. You shall have enlightened them to something. So next time they will act differently. It's about just creating awareness. It's about, I think when we create enough awareness, people will start acting differently and they will start seeing things differently. So those are some of the other many things that can add to whatever you, you talked about. This is true. I've also observed it, and oftentimes it's just encouraging also this young Icelandic um, PhD student. So because he or she might not have seen other people do the same, but it's an increasing emerging practice that acknowledges again everybody's contribution. And as much as you often see acknowledgement um, slides and presentations where the funders are being acknowledged, the people who work with your re with you in your research group, you might as well acknowledge the people who actually facilitated the work in the host country. Like is it just suggested? Another issue that I was just recently, just last year, became aware about was that African scholars have or not all, but some have learned to intentionally not mention their home institution to stand a higher chance of getting the paper through the review process. Um, so instead of listing, like even if they're first or second author, instead of listing Kenyatta University, they would name the partner affiliation which might be Cambridge University, which is a natural go through um, door opener for editors and reviewers. Um, so that also needs to change. So it's basically also a call on the African authors to step up the game. And that can be daunting because you know experience is discouraging oftentimes. But I think there's also increasing awareness that we're all here to contribute and learn from each other as scholars in a global sense. Of course, the acknowledgement should go also to the institutions who provide the facilities, who um, trained and taught the researchers um, throughout the academic career for them to become um, young, ambitious and successful scholars. And then the credit through the research writing then goes to the, the partner institution, it doesn't make sense. But it's a reality that African scholars some, some have faced that it's the only way to get the paper through the review process, or it has been in the past. So there's a need for change of attitude for everybody in the process. Um, so that's something you've also heard about um, as much as, yeah, there might be biases and practice. It is true. It is true that happens. Um, and, and also, I think this also goes to the part of reviewers. And, and that's why I think we say it. Uh, there are a lot of conversations we can have, but uh, so that's why we were. But also, um, reviewers, as I said, we are getting back to them. If if we are going to review, and um, you know, we also have to be very open reviewers, and also be very vigilant, and also just be objective. Because um, if 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 uh, if we realize that uh, reviewers are are, are more, you know, there are chances of my paper being accepted if I list my maybe Nagasaki University in Japan, because that is part of, let's say we were part of a project with Nagasaki and I realized, hey, I'm submitting this paper to uh, uh, a journal and if I list, if, if Nagasaki comes first and then Maseno follows, somebody will look at Nagasaki before they look at Maseno and then they will, you know, they will think that this is a more serious research than if it was just done by, by some Maseno uh, people. And that's true, we are shooting ourselves in the foot and we are trying to, as I say, there's no, we, we are lamenting sometimes, but, and I, you know, I said, uh, sometimes we also have a role to play as the local researchers, because if I'm not proud of Marcel University, 
um, how am I helping the institution being visible? And also, how am I helping myself? Because collaborations can also result out of those things. So if I publish a paper with Maseno University, uh, somebody will read the paper and say, ah, so this was about Nile Party. It was done in Lake Victoria by Maseno. Okay, so I want to collaborate in Kenya. I know where to go. I'll call Maseno University. I'll call people from Maseno University. So researchers and fellow researchers, especially from Africa and the young researchers, it's our time to change things. Um, I, when I say I'm an, I'm a, 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 how do you say, I, I, I still a very a young scholar. There's a professor who told me you are not going to be a young scholar forever. So you start doing things now. You are not young anymore. No scholar is young. Um, so use your experience right now to fix whatever you can fix. So scholars who are just coming into the limelight, I, I think it's, it's my responsibility. It's the responsibility of everyone to also just step up and say, I'm proud of this. Let's just list our institutions and make them be visible because you know we are capable and we have the whatever it takes. Why is it that we are behaving like we don't have what it takes? Because I say it, people will treat you the way you want to, you want to be treated or the way you treat yourself. If today I come and start looking like I'm helpless, I don't know what to do with myself, someone will not be will not be sure about me. They will be like, this guy does not. But if I come out and say, hey, this is I have the capacity, I have the, 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 the chance, and I have the expertise that is required to do this thing. Mm. You know, people, so let's acknowledge our institutions. Let's make them be visible. On, on that note, I want to mention um, the organization called ROAR, ROR.org, which is a persist or provides persistent identifiers like the ORCID ID for researchers. This is an identifier for institutions and affiliations to be mentioned also in the research paper. And an increasing number of publishers integrates that in the submission process to list the, the identifying number based on ROAR as you submit your paper. So basically what affiliation are you from? Is it Masena University? Then look up that, that number, that identifier, and also add it to the, um, to the, yeah, in the submission portal. And we, you will find the link to that as well. So coming to a conclusion um, of this conversation, and it's been really enli enlightening and also, um, it's always uplifting to talk to you and it's always fun and, and thought triggering to have conversations with you and um, I'm very happy that we agreed to have um, a few more to follow up with. But now on this topic, what would be three to five simple steps any scholar can take to for once avoid helicopter science? I think we mentioned a few, but let's just summarize them again. I can maybe do a head start with um, well, you could maintain and showcase, have your public record of your ORCID um, profile, um, where you, ORCID is also currently working on integrating um, the RAW identifier. You can um, mention your home institution, which would be naturally, but sometimes there might be thought barriers or bad experiences from the past that prevent some of us from doing so. Um, to give the a fair acknowledgement and recognition for also the institutions that support our work and to ensure that everybody who contributed is listed as a contributor or author or co-author on a paper as the result of a, a co cooperative and collaborative international research um, journey um, and in lines and aligned with the credit taxonomy. So these are three systems uh, I put on the table. What would be some of the attitude um, in summary from our conversation and maybe one or two more that you can see that each of us can take to do better research in an equitable approach? One is uh, be, be human, uh, even as we do research. So be human, treat other people with respect and respect their views and uh, their expertise and their time and their resources. So whether they're local people or the people you are collaborating with. So even if they are coming from other countries, let's say they are flying in from China and they're coming to your country as a collaborator, just respect them. And because that also encourages openness. If I feel you respect me and respect my values, I'll be very open with you and I'll be able to treat you the best way possible. 
that is one. Uh, secondly, is um, we need to also be very have very candid conversations at the beginning of this uh, of, of, of our collaborations and have very you know very sincere collaborations because sincerity only comes when we are open. So when we are starting conversations, make it very clear that this is what I expect from us. This is the benefit. I'm going to get and this is how publication is going to be done. Let's make it very clear. Any output from any research collaboration, how are we going to, how is it going to be put out there? Who is going to do what? So if publications are going to be done, who is going to do the publication? And if 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 the authorship, how the how is the authorship going to be determined? These are things, if you know that publications are part of the output of your research, of your collaboration, make them very clear and make them part of your collaboration. Make, make them very clear and say, this is the, 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 the procedure that needs to be followed. If you, develop a pro, if you develop a manuscript, it has to go through this and make them very clear so that if somebody violates them, you just point to that and then it's very easy for them to identify, hey, I have violated this one. Um, the other thing is, um, Let's empower local local researchers. Um, so let's train local researchers. And even if it's not about lo if, let's uh, let me not even say local. Let's 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 empower our collaborators. Because if somebody flies in from uh, from from uh, Japan, for example, into Kenya, there is a way we can empower them. We can give them a certain knowledge that they did not have, so that when they go back, it can also help them the other side. So maybe how do we set up experiments in very difficult conditions? What happens when when a flood comes and clears all your crops that you are you are, you are researching on? So how do we ad adjust? Because that might help them the other side. They might also go to a different country, for example, another time. And if they had learned something in your area, then they will know how to handle it elsewhere. So let's empower each other. It's not about empowering the local researchers, but of course that is part of it, but let's empower each other, be open to train. So if somebody comes from a different country and asks you, hey, how do you deal with, with, with drought in this country? Just tell them what you know, so that, that you never know where that will be useful. And uh, I think lastly, let's just open, uh, let's just practice and advocate for open science. That will help so many things. Open science is just be open. I think that is the only thing. Be open about what you feel, be open about what you do, be open about what you think, and be open about how you reason and be open about how you deal with people. Let us be open and let science be open. That's it. I think that will solve everything. Let's be open, let science be open. Yeah, I think a, a very recent new viewpoint I have on open science is I, I keep preaching like open science doesn't mean you have to put everything on the table of the conversations. Yes, like you said, um, be clear about um, your project approach, pre-register um, the project plan, um, basically have a plan in mind before you engage into um, collaborations and, and also inform the prospective collaborators what your goal is and also listen what their stake is on working with you. And um, yeah, like you just said, like be aware that everybody has to bring something to the table and it's not just crisis management, there's regional expertise that um, the Northern partners can learn and should learn and be ready to listen instead of coming with an attitude we're here to teach like everybody's also there to learn and again like not to how to deal with crisis and how to work in a low resource research environment but there's so much expertise also on the topics how to like equal in your like in the terms of fisheries and aquaculture there's local and regional expertise how the ecosystems function what is sustainable fisheries what is traditional fishing how can fish the the fish yield be scaled through technology without harming the ecosystem so everybody wins if we have an open approach and when it comes to the science the project like what open science is calling for is really to, to have a clear project plan, to have open conversations about the approach, and then to make informed decisions, to, to manage your data well, to plan out your data management, and then to package um, in, in sequences along the process, what of our findings can we package in a way that's consumable and informative for other audiences, then just, of like besides the research team that's actually working in the project like at what stage can we communicate to other stakeholders and inform them along the process to also inform ourselves and get feedback from other stakeholders that then will further inform the project itself before we conclude it with a research paper 
So that's basically what open science is and becomes more and more to me. It doesn't mean that you have to put all your cards on the table. There's also a level of closeness, a necessity for closeness in the process in terms of sensitive data and project design. There is an iteration process where it doesn't make sense to put all the messiness online, <laughs> but you want to clean up your data first and learn from it before you can present it to others. So I think that's a common misconception about open science and people are scared like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing here. So how should I make that accessible? It doesn't make sense to me. So I would rather harm the project and myself in doing so. But no, that's not what open science is calling for. It's rather package as well, understand your own research, um, be open about your approach, why you're doing a certain project and that should and can and yeah, should be communicated. And then work with as many stakeholders as feasible for certain projects, give credit to everybody's contributions, and then present the results along the way and also in the final package in the form of a research article or, or a project report or whatever form. Yeah. Enough said. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Aouta. It's been really like um, again i'm repeating myself but it's always a pleasure talking to you and learning from you um and i'm glad we're doing this together and um already keen on our next conversation on this channel and others thank you okay yeah so um this was um uh, uh, i'm grateful for this conversation i think we we needed to have this and we need to have even more of this um i think the most important thing is um helicopter science is happening uh though it's maybe it's reducing because people are becoming more and more aware um but i think we put a, out a few recommendations that are just what we think in this conversation and also we cannot to exhaust all of them in this in this in this one one stating so uh, i think it's just making us aware that it's happening and uh, you know it's not a good thing for science so part of it as we've also mentioned is let's try to practice open science that can also help us uh, solve a bit of this and uh, you know there are so many resources out there and you can always reach out you know access to perspectives for example has you know uh, a way of you can always just ask questions and uh, you can get answers to this, and, but let's try pr practicing uh, just responsible science, responsible research, and you know everything will just be good for everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah.